Hi everyone, good evening. I hope all of you are able to see me and listen to me. If yes, kindly give me a quick confirmation in the chat box. If all is well and if everything is working fine. Okay, so I guess so everything is working well and all is fine now. So today I am here to discuss about the uh, last final run for the FMG students where I'll be discussing only the important images and subsequently along with the images whatever are the important points pertaining to that topic. But before we begin the class and since we have more students joining in, let me just quickly tell you what we have on the iconic subscription of an academy. So we are giving you an academy plus, we are giving you notes 2.0, we are giving you mentoring session and this is going to be at an unbelievable price for 25% discount. So you get, uh, you know, live classes, you get mentoring session and also you get notes from an academy. So this is about the iconic subscription. You can unlock our biggest offer with 25% off, which is valid till today. So make the most of it. I mean, I mean, that's done yesterday. So if you haven't, then you can still try and take the subscription. So let's start without wasting any time. And um, let's discuss about the nerve supply of the external auditory canal, which is a common question that we see during the exam. So this is a repeat topic in FMG asked multiple times. So quickly we will understand and revise the nerve supply. So we all know the mnemonic for remembering the nerve supply is lag 7 and 10. So we have got L standing for lesser occipital nerve, A is standing for auriculotemporal nerve and G is standing for greater auricular nerve. So these are the three main nerves that supply the pinna. Now, if they ask you a question on the maximum portion of the pinna or the greater portion of the pinna or most of the surface of the pinna is supplied by which nerve, then you have to write it as greater auricular nerve. In the name itself, you have the answer greater. Greater means supplies maximum or the most portion of the pinna. So, it's supplied by the greater auricular nerve. So, it supplies the most of the lower half on the medial surface and the lateral surface. So, both the surfaces, front and back, lower half is supplied by the greater auricular nerve. Upper, upper side we have got anteriorly A for A. So anteriorly we have got the auriculotemporal nerve. So the upper half anteriorly we have got the auriculotemporal nerve which is a branch of the trigeminal nerve. So remember auriculotemporal was a branch of trigeminal. And last but not the least the lesser occipital nerve the least supply to the pinna here is by the lesser occipital nerve. Now along with that we have got two cranial nerves which supply the 7th nerve and 10th nerve. So here we have the 7th nerve and 10th nerve which supplies the honka. Now the question that comes is what is the auricular branch of the vagus nerve? So does anybody want to answer in the chat box? What is the auricular branch of vagus called as? Quickly to revise this is your MCQ that has been asked multiple times. Anybody would like to answer? Yes, it's called as Arnold's nerve, also called as Alderman's nerve and this is the nerve that is responsible for causing cough reflex or syncopal reaction whenever you probe the external auditory canal. So when you're doing a syringing or you're doing a probing to remove the wax, you will have the cough reflex mediated by the Arnold's nerve. So this is about the pinna and the uh, nerve supply of the pinna. This is a common question that is asked during the exam. Now let us go and identify some of the images related to here. So first we will begin with the normal tympanic membrane. So this is normal. How do we know this is normal? Because we are able to see the cone of light. Usually the cone of light is indicative of a normal and a healthy tympanic membrane. If you have a distorted cone of light, it means that the tympanic membrane is abnormal. Now what we see here is the handle of malleus. The point where the tip of handle of malleus attaches is called as umbo. What we see here is called as the cone of light. Now around the tympanic membrane at the past tensor we have got a fibrocartilaginous ring. This fibrocartilaginous ring is called as annulus. Now from the malleus, handle of malleus, we have two folds, anterior malleolar fold and posterior malleolar fold. So the longer fold is your posterior malleolar fold, the shorter fold is your anterior malleolar fold. So this separates your past tensor below from the pars flaccida above. 
Now, if your cone of light is lying between 3 to 6 o'clock position, we call it as the right tympanic membrane. So, you got to look for the position of cone of light to understand it is right or left. So, if it is between 3 to 6 o'clock position, it is right. And if it is between 6 to 9 o'clock position, if you see here, then we call, uh, sorry, 6 to 9 o'clock position, then we call it as left tympanic membrane. So, this is your left tympanic membrane. So this is how you understand normal structures on the tympanic membrane, identify right and left. Usually you will see the ossicles in the posterior superior quadrant. So if you can see here, we can see the long process of the incus as well, the reflection of the long process of incus. So ossicles are present in which quadrant? Posterior superior quadrant. So this is about the normal tympanic membrane. Now in today's session, I'm not going to ask you any questions at all because uh, we are, I mean, I mean, of course I will ask you a little bit, but not MCQ style because this is going to be your final run and quick revision. I don't want to tense you before the exam. Just give you that final last pieces of information that you just need to quickly revise before you go to the exam hall. Okay, so here I'm sure all of you know the diagnosis. If you know, please type in the chat box. It's very simple. You can see the tympanic membrane is red. It is congested. You can see the blood vessels are radiating from the periphery to the center. So you can make out the blood vessels radiating from periphery to center. We call this appearance as cartwheel appearance. Now this cartwheel appearance is extremely specific for one condition. Anybody would like to answer, please mention in the chat box. What is cartwheel appearance seen? Cartwheel appearance is seen in ASOM, so acute saturative otitis media is a condition which is caused by streptococcus presenting to you with a duration of less than 4 weeks and the patient typically has 3 primary symptoms that you should know, not, know of, pain in the ear, there will be hearing loss and fever. These are the three primary symptoms that you should know for ASOM and one very important thing if they are asking you children the age group is children with pain, with hearing loss, with fever. You must answer it as ASOM only. And specifically, if they give you this appearance, more so tells you about ASOM. Now, what are the other signs we see in ASOM? Remember, we also see that there is a lighthouse sign, which is nothing but pulsatile otoria that reflects light. What is pulsatile otoria? When there is a stage of resolution, you will see there is a perforation in the tympanic membrane and the pus comes out in a pulsatile form and that reflects light. That sign is called as lighthouse sign and the type of discharge that comes out is, called, is in a pulsatile format. So we call it as pulsatile otoria. <clears throat> okay. So I hope all of you are clear with the different signs that we see in ASOM. And uh, the treatment is typically about giving antibiotics, no investigation. There's one question that you can still expect. What is the role of myringotomy? You do a surgery called as myringotomy in patients with ASOM. Now, what is the role of myringotomy in patients who are presenting to you with excruciating ear pain or with bulging drum? Incomplete resolution despite antibiotics, persistent effusion beyond 12 weeks and ASOM with facial palsy. These are the four indications of myringotomy. So what are the four indications? Excruciating pain with bulging drum, no resolution despite antibiotics, persistent effusion beyond 12 weeks and if there is acute separative otitis media with facial nerve palsy, that's an indication for myringotomy. Now what's the site of myringotomy? The site of myringotomy is posterior inferior quadrant and the incision is a curvilinear incision. So this completes a quick revision on the entire topic of ASOM. Okay, so now let's go to the next image. Very quickly, today I have about 50 images for discussion. So I think we should go a little, uh, you know, a little more faster. So if this pace is fine with everyone, I'll continue in the same pace. But if you think that I need to slow down, please do not hesitate and ask me so. Okay. So can you see this tympanic membrane and tell me what could be the diagnosis here? There is a specific appearance that you see here. Do you see there are some air bubbles? What does this air bubbles tell you? Now here the picture is very simple. The clinical history will be again a child. But here the only symptom they will present to you is a hearing loss. They will not they will not have pain. There will be no fever. So no fever, no hearing loss. But, uh, sorry, no fever, no pain, but there is a hearing loss in a child should suspect to you for SOM. Non-saturative otitis media, secretory otitis media, or glue ear, all of that is suggestive to you for NSOM. And typically, what is the appearance that you get? Air bubbles. 
yes so bubble appearance is also very right so if you get air bubbles and if you get air fluid level so you can see there is a fluid level above and an air level below so air bubble and air fluid level is specific for som there are other signs as well the tympanic membrane may be thick it can be thin it can be dull it can be lusterless there may be loss of cone of light all of them are different signs which may be present may not be present but the hallmark is definitely going to be presence of air bubbles and air fluid level now how do we diagnose this you are going to do the tympanometry in asom i never said you any investigation but here we are going to do a tympanometry of course tuning fork test and audiometry we do but on a tympanometry what is the graph that we see we will see a b type of graph so presence of b type of graph is hallmark of som and then how are we going to treat it initially you're going to wait and watch if on wait and watch it does not resolve for 12 weeks so three months you're going to wait and watch give medication decongestants it may or may not require steroids that's controversial let's leave that but medical management and wait and watch for first 12 weeks three months if there is no improvement then you go for myringotomy plus grome so the surgery that we do here is going to be myringotomy plus grome where we place a ventilating tube the myringotomy is done in the antero inferior quadrant and a radial incision is given so antero inferior quadrant and radial incision tells you that it is done for a patient with s1 so i hope that's clear to everyone let's see the next image what is this image telling to you you see that there is a perforation in the tympanic membrane which is occupying all the quadrants so what do you think is this this is a subtotal perforation meaning all the quadrants are involved but the annulus is intact so you can clearly make out the annulus is intact so when the annulus is intact what do we say it is a subtotal perforation so it's involving all the quadrant with intact annulus is a subtotal perforation now in a subtotal perforation of the part sensor which has been non-healing then we call it as a tubo tympanic type of csom so whenever there is a part tensor perforation and this is a non-healing type of perforation we call it as tubo tympanic type of csom what you see here this structure is your handle of malleus this is your long process of incus articulating with the head of stapes and what you see here is the tendon of stapedius muscle coming from the pyramid so what you, what you see here is the stapedius muscle now what is this this is your promontory so the structure that you see the bulge that you see is going to be your promontory antero inferior quadrant receives the opening of eustachian tube and this is the opening of the round window membrane so foot plate of the stapes goes and rests on the oval window which is above and we have got the round window below so these are all the structures that we can see through the perforation so i hope this is clear to everybody let's go to the next image now this is a diagnostic you know a uh, you know diagnostic image of a particular condition where you see a whitish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane so when you get a whitish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane what is your diagnosis there is no prior history of any otoria no prior history of any ear surgery and there is no positive otological disease this criteria is called as yes very good dinesh it's called as cholesteatoma it is seen in congenital cholesteatoma so in congenital cholesteatoma you see this in congenital cholesteatoma we see a whitish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane and the criteria is called as levinson's criteria for congenital cholesteatoma so this is Levinson's criteria for congenital cholesteatoma. Okay, so that's about congenital cholesteatoma. Now, can you tell me what is this image showing to you? You see, there is a pars flaccida retraction. So what are you seeing? You're seeing that there is a pars flaccida retraction, and in the pars flaccida retraction pocket, there is something lying inside. So what is it? There are some whitish keratin flakes. What does it say?
so this whitish keratin flakes in the pars flaccida is suggestive to you of acquired cholesteatoma so that is suggestive to you of acquired cholesteatoma now how does cholesteatoma spread is it by pressure is it by enzymes how does the cholesteatoma spread it is by production of enzymes what enzymes does a cholesteatoma produce cholesteatoma produces collagenase acid phosphatase alkaline phosphatase and other proteolytic enzymes so it produces all these enzymes and through these enzymes it's going to cause erosion so that's about acquired cholesteatoma now can you all tell me what is this suggestive to you of there is multiple perforations of the tympanic membrane you can see in the past tense that there is not one not two but there are three perforations whenever you see multiple perforations of the tympanic membrane you should know about a particular diagnosis so what is your diagnosis here yes very good multiple perforation is suggestive to you of tuberculous otitis media so if you see this you must think about tbom tuberculous otitis media is a painless condition in the ear but usually in the larynx it's quite a painful condition okay so in the larynx it is a painful condition but rest everywhere it is a painless condition so whenever you think about tuberculous otitis media you should think about yeah so this is a painless disease in the ear but elsewhere it is quite painful condition tb larynx is a painful condition here they have hearing loss that is disproportionate to the disease so hearing loss is disproportionate to the amount of uh, disease that we see so the disease is much lesser but the amount of hearing loss is much higher so in tbom you will see this you can also expect the patient to have facial palsy so these are all important pointers regarding tbom now let me let me ask you this question what are what is this sign so here you are seeing a typical appearance which is called as flamingo pink appearance of the promontory so where do you get flamingo pink appearance of the promontory <clears throat> flamingo pink appearance of the promontory seen through an intact tympanic membrane we call this sign as schwart sign very good sonali jain this is seen in otosclerosis so this is a sign that we see in <coughs> excuse me this is a sign that we see in otosclerosis so in otosclerosis we will see that the tympanic membrane is normal with the restriction there will be a restricted mobility of the tympanic membrane only when we have an active focus we can see this sign where there is an active deposition of disease happening we can see this schwart sign positive typically the patient will present to you with only hearing loss so the main complaint is a conductive hearing loss typically in the age group of 20 to 40 years females more than males it is an autosomal dominant condition with incomplete penetrance it is associated with a syndrome which is called as vanderhoof syndrome so remember vanderhoof syndrome which is otosclerosis blue sclera and osteogenesis imperfecta so the syndrome is vanderhoof syndrome where you can get otosclerosis blue sclera and osteogenesis imperfecta and uh, how do you diagnose this again the diagnosis is on the basis of tympanometry if the tympanometry will show you as type of tympanogram it is specific audiometry again is going to tell you diagnosis here we are going to get a notch which is called as karhart's notch karhart's notch is a notch that you see in bone conduction curve at 2000 hertz so it is a dip at 2000 hertz in the bone conduction curve now treatment there is a medical treatment like sodium fluoride which is given in active focus surgery stepidotomy or stepidectomy with placement of prosthesis will be done for otosclerosis now here there is a very important sign that you should know and remember 
that sign is called as paraacusis vilsi what is paraacusis vilsi the patient hears better in which environment noisy environment as compared to silent environment that's a very important sign that you see in otosclerosis so i think that sort of refreshes your head on otosclerosis now let's go to the next thing what are you seeing here there is a red reflex near the floor of the tympanic membrane what does this red reflex suggest to you of there is a red reflex in the floor of the tympanic membrane what is this sign called as i'm waiting for all your answers this red reflex that you see in the through the floor of the middle ear this appearance is called as rising sun appearance and rising sun appearance is typically seen in a particular condition which is called as glomus tumor so in a glomus patient we will see that there is a red reflex passing that is there at the floor of the middle ear and on increasing the pressure in the canal the tumor vibrates vigorously and then becomes pale that sign is called as brown sign that is a clinical sign we have got another sign where we see that on uh, compressing the carotid the tumor becomes pale that sign is called as aquino sign so we have two signs a brown sign and an aquino sign the investigation of choice to diagnose glomus tumor is going to be a contrast enhanced ct scan where you will see a sign which is called as phelps sign so phelps sign is a radiological sign where you will see that there is a loss of bone between the carotid and the jugular so you need to know only the names of the sign phelps sign aquino sign brown sign and there is also an appearance that you see on an mri the appearance is called as salt and pepper appearance now you are going to do an angiography to identify the feeding vessel once you do the angiography you are going to embolize followed by embolization you will do a surgical excision so the treatment for glomus is embolization followed by surgical excision now what you have to remember or what you tend to forget in your exams is this is a tumor that secretes catecholamines because it's a paraganglioma it is originating from the paraganglionic cells so remember there will be headache there will be palpitation there will be sweating there will be tachycardia there will be anxiety all these symptoms of catecholamine excess will be present in patients with glomus tumor so i think this is something that we should remember for patients with glomus so now if that's done now let's see the next image you're seeing something here there is a red color blood there is a perforation through the tympanic membrane so can you tell me what is the diagnosis here i'm waiting for your answers yes so here whenever you see the blood in the external auditory canal and you see the perforation and you think that the the, the flap of the tympanic membrane has reflected it's come out or it's opening on the outside of the canal this is suggestive to you of a traumatic perforation so whenever there is a history of trauma you must think about a traumatic perforation and traumatic perforation will usually result in spontaneous healing so you don't have to do anything usually you can expect a spontaneous healing within 12 weeks so spontaneous healing occurs in less than 12 weeks and if it doesn't occur then you are going to do a surgery so if they ask you treatment for traumatic perforation you are going to wait and watch for 12 weeks if it doesn't uh, you know heal then you are going to do a myringoplasty so if no healing if you don't see any healing then you are going to do a myringoplasty or type 1 tympanoplasty so you will usually do just a myringoplasty so that's about tympanic membrane perforation now can you tell me what is this appearance called as whether skin over the mastoid is red shiny edematous and stretched yes jyotirmay dinesh sonali uh, neha pooja patel i'm waiting for your answers shubham so you see that the tympanic membrane uh, sorry the skin over the mastoid is stretched it is red it is edematous what do you think is the name of this sign this sign is called as very good this is called as iron doubt very good jyotirmay this is called as iron doubt appearance of the mastoid iron doubt appearance of the mastoid has got a specific uh, you know it is seen as the first sign in which condition it is the first sign of acute mastoiditis so it is the first sign that you see in patients with acute mastoiditis 
okay so that is about acute mastitis now here we see multiple other signs we can also see you know uh, the um, pulsatile otoria we can also see lighthouse sign there are different signs which we see here but pulsatile otoria and lighthouse sign are common which you see in both asom and mastitis but the specific sign what is specific sign this is your mcq what is the specific sign for mastitis then your answer should be reserve warrior sign so reserve warrior sign is the specific sign that we see in patients with mastitis so that's about mastitis now let's see this sign here they'll give you a history of trauma after trauma you see that there is a bluish discoloration of the mastoid what does that tell you with the history of trauma whenever you get a bluish discoloration of mastoid you must think about battle sign and battle sign is a sign that you see whenever there is a middle cranial fossa fracture so fracture of the middle cranial fossa will present to you with battle sign okay so that's about it now let's see the next image we are seeing there is a newspaper like appearance a wet newspaper like appearance and you see some fungal spores over there what is the diagnosis yes you can see some blackish dots whitish discharge resembling the newspaper this appearance is called as wet newspaper like appearance and this is seen in fungal infections which is otomycosis so in otomycosis the commonest organism responsible for causing otomycosis is aspergillus niger very good it is aspergillus niger followed by candida followed by aspergillus fumigatus so the most common is aspergillus niger the second most common is candida followed by we have aspergillus fumigatus so this is about otomycosis and the treatment is topical antifungal we do not start with systemic antifungal and along with that topical antifungal we give um, you know medications like salicylic acid that will help in desquamating the epithelium because the fungus lies in the layers of epidermis so we want to take off the epithelium as well so once the treatment is uh, done and we see the resolution of the disease we still continue for a week the and uh, medication because we do not want any amount of subclinical infection to persist now whenever there is an otomycosis you should always 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 rule out some immunosuppression especially diabetes mellitus this has to be surely ruled out so that is about otomycosis now look at this and tell me you see vesicles in the area of distribution of the facial nerve so you have vesicles in the area of distribution of facial nerve and you have facial nerve palsy element type of facial nerve palsy the patient can also have eighth nerve palsy so where do you get this triad of seventh nerve eighth nerve and the cycles very good so nally this is seen in ramsey hunt syndrome which is also called as herpes zoster oticus this is called as ramsey hunt syndrome which is nothing but herpes zoster oticus where we see that the varicella zoster virus remains latent in the geniculate ganglion and whenever there is a immunosuppression there is reactivation of virus and that reactivation of virus will result in Over cycles in the area of distribution of the facial nerve, and there will be eighth nerve involvement and seventh nerve involvement. Now the prognosis of this condition is poor. They will require antiviral. They may also require steroids. The patient has to be treated early to have a better prognosis. Okay, so now let's see what is this image showing to you. This is an image showing to you an anterior rhinoscopy. So on anterior rhinoscopy, what are all the structures that we see? First of all, when we are doing an anterior rhinoscopy, we need what instrument we use? This speculum is called as tudicum's nasal speculum. So this is a common speculum that we use everywhere. So the tudicum's nasal speculum is used. What you see here medially. this is going to be your septum okay so nirmala this is not a polyp these are normal projections that you see in the lateral wall of the nose what are these projections suggesting to you the one that you see below is going to be your inferior turbinate the one above is middle turbinate we cannot see the superior turbinate on anterior rhinoscopy and even was difficult it's difficult to visualize even on endoscopy so you'll have to thoroughly decongest and then you'll you'll be able to visualize the uh, superior turbinate usually it requires a little bit of experience to see the superior turbinate so what we see here is medially the septum 
laterally we can see the inferior turbinate and the middle turbinate the angle that we have here this is called as the internal nasal valve so we can only see this structure we can see the floor of the middle ear but we cannot see anything else we cannot see the olfactory cleft olfactory trunk nothing now if this if we correspond the same image here what is this this is septum which is the medial wall on the lateral wall we see certain projection this is the inferior turbinate this is the middle turbinate so this is your endoscopic view showing the same we can see the floor of the middle ear and the floor of the middle inferior meatus and the middle meatus what we cannot see is superior turbinate and the superior meatus which are way higher up and that require thorough decongestion and then only you will be able to visualize so that's about the normal nasal endoscopic manifestations now what is this tumor which is also called as anybody this happens due to hypertrophy of the sebaceous gland in patients with acne rosacea so what is this so hypertrophy of sebaceous glands in patients with acne rosacea seen in elderly seen in diabetics this is also a common you know image based questions that you can get yes this is nothing but rhinophyma so rhinophyma is a condition which happens due to hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands in patients with acne rosacea in those who are elderly and those who are diabetic the treatment of this is going to be laser debridement of the hypertrophic tissue followed by skin grafting so you are going to do debridement plus skin grafting to cover the raw, raw surface so this is about rhinophyma now again the anterior rhinoscopy what you see here this is your septum but do you see the septum is bent towards the left side so the image is showing to you a dns a deviated nasal septum so in a deviated nasal septum the most important thing is to know the symptoms which is nasal obstruction difficulty in breathing headache facial pain external deformity and recurrent middle ear infections why should you know the symptoms because they are an indication for surgery if a patient has simple dns and no symptoms would you say surgery no but if a patient has symptoms and is also having dns then that is a patient who would require surgery the surgery are of two types septoplasty and smr so we will we will choose septoplasty most often because it's a conservative surgery smr is a radical surgery there is a line where we draw a line from the frontal spine to the anterior nasal spine so any deviations anteriorly are treated only by septoplasty and any deviations posteriorly are treated only by either by septoplasty or by smr so any anterior deviations are treated only by septoplasty posterior the choice you can either treat by septoplasty or smr so that's about uh, septoplasty and smr for dns now you can see these are specific findings where you see dark circles around the eye you have got a allergic salute and you have a dark line on the dorsum of the nose this is called as Darius line. So all of these are specific findings that we would see in patients with allergic rhinitis. So please look for these signs in the exam paper. Or if you see this sign, it's suggestive to you of allergic rhinitis. Okay. Let's go to the next one. You see that there is a bossing on the forehead. You see the CT scan showing to you an air filled swelling. Why do I know it's air filled swelling? Because you see it's black and it is not white. The image is showing to you black shadow, not the white shadow. So whenever you have got an air air filled swelling within the sinuses, we call it as pneumatoses. So it's an air filled swelling where the air gets trapped within the and the air can expand and expand over a period of time to produce symptoms now look at this image and tell me what is the diagnosis you are seeing there is swelling of the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid following sinusitis so what do you think will be the diagnosis here the swelling of upper and lower eyelid is usually suggestive to you of orbital cellulitis 
and whenever you have orbital cellulitis it is usually secondary to a sinus infection usually lower eyelid edema will suggest to you of a maxillary sinusitis upper eyelid edema will suggest to you of frontal sinusitis both upper and lower eyelid edema will suggest to you that there is an ethmoidal sinusitis so ethmoidal sinusitis is presenting to you with both upper eyelid and lower eyelid swelling so upper eyelid and lower eyelid swelling will be present in patients with ethmoidal sinusitis. I look at this a very important question which keeps often occurring in your examination. So what do you think is the diagnosis here? There is a red vascular mass. This red vascular mass has got sporangia. Within the sporangia we have got some spores. What do you think is the diagnosis? We have a red vascular mass for angia with spores caused by an aquatic protozoan. That aquatic protozoan is nothing but, yes, it is Nirmala, not rhinoscleroma. It is rhinosporidiosis. Okay, so it is rhinosporidiosis. So rhinosporidiosis is caused by an aquatic protozoan. Scleroma is caused by a gram-negative bacteria. There we see mucilic cells and Russell bodies. This is caused by an aquatic protozoan. Yes, which is rhinosporidium seaberry. And uh, uh, yes, this is rhinosporidiosis caused by rhinosporidium seaberry. The treatment is excision of the mass and cauterization of the base. So the treatment will be excision of the mass plus cauterization of the base. Okay, so that's about rhinosporidiosis. Now, this is an image showing to you scleroma. The hallmark is the presence of a woody hard nodule. So, if you hear the word woody hard nodule, you must think about rhinoscleroma. There are two typical cells that suggest to you for the rhinoscleroma. The first one is called as miculic cells. The second one is called as Russell body. So, presence of miculic cells and Russell bodies are hallmark of rhinoscleroma. The drug of choice for treating rhinoscleroma is streptomycin, tetracycline, with or without rifampicin. So streptomycin, tetracycline, rifampicin are the drugs that we use for patients with rhinoscleroma and we will have to debride the dead tissue. Uh, Nirmala Dapsone is used for rhinosporidiosis to prevent recurrence. Here we don't use rhin in rhinoscleroma, we don't use. Okay, dear? Now, what is this image suggesting to you? You have a greenish, you know, uh, a greenish mass or a greenish crust in the uh, nasal cavity. Whenever you have got a greenish crust, you should think very quickly about atrophic rhinitis. So, this atrophic rhinitis is a condition which is caused by Klebsiella oziana. This Klebsiella oziana is a gram negative bacteria. This gram-negative bacteria is responsible for causing atrophic rhinitis. Now, uh, this is also called as uh, Peri's bacillus. Now, in atrophic rhinitis, we have a specific finding which is called as merciful anosmia. What is merciful anosmia? Merciful anosmia is patient themselves are unaware of the foul smell, but the people around them complain of foul smell coming from their nose. So this occurs due to atrophy of the olfactory epithelium, atrophy of the nasal glands, all of that will result in merciful anosmia. The treatment is first with nasal washing, which is by alkaline nasal douching solution, which consists of sodium chloride, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium biborate which is mixed in water and the nasal cavity is irrigated with this along with this what are we going to do if the patient needs we can give glycerol we can give placental extracts we can give estrogen therapy if it doesn't come down then what we do is young's operation where we completely close the nasal cavity if it does not help then we are going to do a modified young's operation where we leave a 10 mm open so young's or modified young's is for atrophic rhinitis now this is again a very common question which is called as the uh, there is a sign given to this. Can you tell me what is the name of this sign? Yes, what is the name given to this sign? This is called as target sign. This is also called as double ring sign. 
and this is a sign that we see in which kind of patients in those patients who have traumatic csf rhinorrhea not spontaneous it is seen in traumatic csf rhinorrhea so whenever there is a traumatic csf rhinorrhea we will see that there is a central red dot and this central red dot is surrounded by peripheral halo so this sign is seen in traumatic type of csf rhinorrhea not in a spontaneous one and is this a specific sign? No. What is the specific test? It is the presence of beta 2 transferrin. If beta 2 transferrin is positive, then it will tell you that the fluid that is coming from the nose is definitely CSF. Now, how do we localize the leak from what side? We know the leak is CSF, but how do I know which area in the nose is leaking? The roof, which part? Is it the cribriform plate? Is it the fovea ethmoidalis? How do I localize the leak? So, to localize the site of leak, the investigation of choice is CT cisternography. In CT cisternography, what do we do is we inject, we do a lumbar puncture and we inject dye in the, in the uh, intercecal space. That dye goes through the entire CSF and comes into, stains the entire CSF and if there is a leak, it leaks through the defect into the nose and when we take a CT scan, we can identify the course of CSF by detecting the dye. That investigation is called as CT cisternography. Yes, Nirmala, you are right. The most common site of uh, CSF leak is cribriform plate of the ethmoid. So, it's the cribriform plate that commonly leaks. Or well, that is the commonest site by we see because it's a very thin bone. Now, what is the treatment? You are going to close the leak endoscopically most often. Now, this is again an image that is repeated quite often. This is of the nasopharynx. So, in the nasopharynx, you see that there is an opening of the tube. This tube is called as eustachian tube. Behind that, you see there is a cushion. This cushion is called as torus tuberius. And behind the torus tuberius, you are going to see there is a depression. What is this depression? This depression is called as fossa of Rosenmuller. Fossa of Rosenmuller is the most common site for origin of NPC. So it's the most common site of origin of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So if they give you a growth here, you should think about NPC. But if they give you a growth in the midline of the nasopharynx, then most often in children, it will be an adenoid. So you should know what we are talking. So whenever we're talking about the midline of the nasopharynx, it's usually the adenoid. And if it is the fossa of Rosenmuller, it is going to be the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So that's about the nasopharynx. You see now there's another image shown to you a red vascular mass in the nasopharynx. So this is again a constant question a red vascular mass in the nasopharynx is suggestive to you of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Now in JNA there are so many signs. The first sign that we see is called as frog face deformity. So where there is proptosis, there is swelling of the cheek, there's widening of the nasal bridge, we call this deformity as frog face deformity so the presence of frog face deformity should suggest to you of jna bleeding and there can be cranial nerve palsies the second third fourth fifth and sixth nerve palsies could occur and now how do i identify uh, jna the investigation of choice is contrast enhanced ct scan where we see a sign where we see anterior bowing of the posterior wall of maxillary sinus we call that sign as hallman miller sign so what is the name of the sign it is called as hallman miller sign that is very specific for juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma the treatment is embolization followed by surgical excision so we will embolize the tumor and then we are going to do a surgery for removal of the tumor so that's about uh, JNA. There are many things, but this is what you should know. Yes, one more thing the most common supply to the JNA is via which artery? It is the internal maxillary artery. Now, this is different phases of tonsillitis. The first phase where the tonsil is just red, but it is not enlarged. So it's only red, no enlargement. We call it as superficial tonsillitis. This progresses to a phase where you see whitish yellow dots in the surface of the tonsil, which we call it as follicular tonsillitis then this goes to a phase where the tonsils are red and they are enlarged this type of tonsillitis we call it as parenchymal type of tonsillitis and last but not the least you see a membrane that is limited to the tonsil we call it as membranous tonsillitis so these are the features of acute tonsillitis that you need to know
Now, acute tonsillitis should be differentiated from this condition, which we call it as diphtheria. So, here you see a grayish white membrane, not a pearly white membrane. The membrane is not just limited to the tonsil, but the membrane is spreading to the adjacent site. This is not a true membrane, this is a pseudo membrane. On peeling the membrane, the underlying surface will bleed. So, on peeling, you will see that there is an underlying bleeding. So, these are all specific features for diphtheric membrane. So, this has to be known by all of you. The second important thing here is you should know that there will be toxic features and there will be a specific appearance of the neck, which we call it as bull neck. So, if you get a toxic feature and a bull neck, think about diphtheria. Okay. Yes, so I hope everything is running fine. On my end, it is stuck. Is it good with all of you? Yeah, I think now it's working well. Now look at this sign. You are seeing that there is a enlargement of the tonsil with uvula bulging to the other side. So whenever you get a unilateral enlargement of the tonsil, so whenever you get an unilateral enlargement of the tonsil, you must think about two differential diagnoses. What are the two differential diagnoses? The first differential diagnosis is peritonsillar abscess. The second one is your parapharyngeal abscess. So when we think about peritonsillar abscess, there will be no neck swelling there because the peritonsillar space does not extend to the neck. It doesn't go to the neck. But parapharyngeal space does. So parapharyngeal space extends to the neck. So parapharyngeal space extends to the neck. Peritonsillar space does not extend. So if there is a space that has a swelling in the neck with a tonsillar bulge, you must think it is peritonsillar abscess. Sorry, parapharyngeal abscess, and there is no neck swelling, then you have to think about peritonsillar abscess. Now, what is this image where you see a bulge on one side of the pharynx? Not in the midline, but on the side. So this is suggestive to you of retropharyngeal abscess. So retropharyngeal space is on the side of the pharynx. So whenever you get a abscess or a swelling on the one side of the midline, so this is your midline on the side of the midline, it is suggestive to you of retropharyngeal abscess. Now if you see there is a swelling in the midline, you are seeing that there is a swelling in the midline. So whenever you get a midline swelling, you must think about pre-vertebral abscess. So pre-vertebral abscess presents to you as a midline swelling. Now this is an image showing to you a whitish accumulation of uh, debris within the tonsil suggestive to you of tonsillolith. Okay, so tonsillolith is there inside the crypt of the tonsil. Now, this is a normal larynx. They can ask you a question on normal larynx. The structure that you see here is your epiglottis. This is your arytenoids. This is your airy epiglottic fold. This here is your pyriform fossa. This here that you see is your post phrequoid region. And what you see here is the posterior pharyngeal wall. So, this is all the structures that you should see. And also appreciate the false cords above, the true cords below, going to the subglottis, from there it goes to the trachea. So these are all the structures that you should visualize in a normal larynx. Now look at this and tell me what could be the diagnosis. This is the most common congenital anomaly of the larynx. So what is this most common congenital anomaly of the larynx? Where the child presents to you with inspiratory strider. This inspiratory strider increases in supine position, increases on crying, increases during feeding. Yes, very good. This is called as laryngomalacia. So laryngomalacia on examination gives a typical appearance where we see that the epiglottis is folded upon itself. So when the epiglottis is folded upon itself, we call it as an appearance which is called as omega shaped epiglottis. So whenever you get an omega shaped epiglottis, you must know that it is about laryngomalacia. Now what is this condition where the epiglottis is red, swollen, edematous? What does it say? With a typical appearance where the child is sitting in a tripod position. 
Yes, very good. This is suggestive to you of acute epiglottitis. In acute epiglottitis, on radiology, you will see a sign which is called as thumb sign. So, thumb sign is very specific for acute epiglottitis. This position where the child is leaning forward for air, this position is called as tripod position, most commonly caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. Now here you are seeing bilateral symmetrical swellings on the vocal cord called as singer's nodule, teacher's nodule, hawker's nodule. This is very specific for vocal cord nodules. This happens due to chronic abuse of voice. That is why it occurs in teachers, singers, hawkers, you know, all of them. And the treatment is initially voice rest. If it still persists, then you will have to do a microlaryngeal surgery. Now, this is the last image for the day. Here, you are able to see that there is a swelling present on the external neck. And you see on radiology, it is air-filled because it's appearing black. So, an air-filled swelling where you get a trans-elimination test positive, cystic swelling occurring in trumpet blowers, glass blowers, weight lifters, we call it as laryngosis. Yes, this occurs due to dilatation of saccule. Saccule is a part of the ventricle of the larynx. The treatment is marsupialization of the swing. So with this, I yes, uh, the Bryce's sign is positive. That's true, Rikraki, I agree with you. So that's about uh, laryngocele. I hope all of you understood the images so far, what we did. So just recollect all we did, nodule, epiglottitis, laryngomalacia. And then we did about normal larynx, tonsillolith. Three vertebral abscess, retropharyngeal abscess, peritonsillar abscess, diphtheria, tonsillitis, JNA, adenoid, target ring sign, which is seen in CSF, atrophic rhinitis, rhinoscleroma, rhinosporidiosis, ethmoidal sinusitis, pneumatocele, allergic rhinitis, yes, deviated nasal septum, rhinophyma, and normal anatomy of the nose, element type of facial palsy, which we call it as Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Of course, Bell's palsy, you all would know. Otomycosis, battle sign, and then we have mastoiditis, traumatic perforation, and glomus tumor, uh, otosclerosis, TBOM, CSOM, you know, the acquired and the congenital type, and CSOM, which is tubocentranic type. And yes, of course, after this, we learned about ASOM and SOM. So with this, I think that most of the normal and abnormal images that are required for your exam to have covered up in this last run. I didn't want to fill you with more information because whatever you know, we need to just revise in the last moment. I don't want to pressurize you or give you something new that's going to only discourage and uh, you know reduce your morale to uh, you know thinking that what have I not known, what have I missed. But instead, I wanted you to reinforce your concepts, reinforce your images, reinforce the memory of all the concepts behind these images and I hope that you guys understood all of this. Okay Rafi, uh, nasal fractures, it's very simple. Whenever we ta ta talk about nasal fractures, we have got, uh, you know, type 1, type 2 and type 3 fractures. You remember that type 1, it resembles, 1 is vertical, right? The line is vertical. So vertical fracture is a type 1 fracture. It is also called as Chevalier's fracture. So there are two vertical lines. So Chevalier's fracture is a vertical fracture, also called as type 1 fracture. Type 2 fracture is called as horizontal fracture because the fracture line is horizontal, also called as Jarjaway's fracture. And the type 3 fracture is having three components, naso, orbito and the ethmoid. So naso, orbito, ethmoid fracture is going to be your type 3 fracture. So if they give you a fracture line running like this, where you see that there is a vertical line, it is Chevalier. If you see a fracture line going horizontal, then it is charge away and if they give you a deformity where the nose is crushed and the nose tip is tilted up because of the crush of the nose ethmoid and the orbit we call it as um, you know the type 3 naso orbito ethmoid fracture okay So if you've got any doubts, any discussion, anything that you would like to ask me, please don't hesitate. I'm here. I don't know. I think it got stuck for a while. Let me see.
yeah i think now it's fine so if you've got any doubts anything that you'd like to ask me in this last moment just one day before of your exam i just want to know if is there anything that i can help you with please let me know. take this opportunity to ask me anything don't feel shy don't hesitate it's okay because now still you have the time but once you finish your exam you can't go back and revisit and do last tips that i'd like to give before you enter the exam hall is first leave the fear outside the exam hall whatever has to happen will happen whatever you have already prepared is done what is that is still in your hand is to do whatever you can do to your best in the exam hall so leave the fear of what is going to happen ahead and leave the fear of what you have not done prior what you need to do is be in the time of exam hall put your all efforts only for the exam think in a positive mindset think with some presence of mind you will be able to get to the answers even if you haven't studied some topic so don't look at the name and think that i have never studied this a scenario i have never known you will know it it's just that keep your mind open don't put thought blocks or filters that nothing i know i haven't gone prepared well to the exam even if you are prepared there will be feelings that so i don't know i have forgotten that kind of feeling is normal it's not abnormal it's just that you need to trust yourself trust that i can do it go to the exam hall with a positive mindset tell yourself again and again it's not that we tell it just to keep telling it to you but it's to just reinforce and reiterate the importance of how how much you should keep telling yourself that i know i know i can i will i will do it i will do my best just keep telling it to yourself you will automatically feel better you will feel comfortable and the exam hall don't panic for any moment just see that if you whatever questions you know just keep solving whatever you don't know let's keep it to the side let's not break our head on that just keep a mindset that yes i'm going to go i'm going to do well i'm going to crack my exam i'm just going to finish this and let's see whatever happens later okay so that's about how to prepare for the examination wishing you all lots and lots and lots of good luck and lots of best wishes from my side i'll be waiting to hear from all of you how you performed in your examination okay so yes uh, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma rakhi the treatment for stage 1 and stage 2 is rt whereas stage 3 and stage 4 is chemo rt okay pradeep for the symptom of rinkis edema is mainly hoarseness of voice they can also have a double voice but diplophonia is a typical feature of a polyp so if they give you a question on diplophonia or a double voice first see if is polyp there in your option if polyp is not there then go for rinkis edema but main symptom will be hoarseness of voice where they cannot raise the pitch of their voice uh, pradeep subjective test and objective test when we come to subjective test tuning fork test audiometry speech audiometry test for recruitment these are all subjective where the patient is giving the response but objective test tympanometry tepidial reflex and then we have got auto acoustic emission we have got para we have electrocochleography all these these all these tests are machine generated tests where the patient has got no involvement so they are objective whereas subjective is where the patient is giving the response we call them as subjective got it so is there anything else that you want me to tell anything else that you want me to answer okay so lots and lots of love to all of you lots of warm hugs and best wishes i am just hoping that all of you will do your best in the exam hall come out happy and i'm sure you will do the best to whatever you can and don't worry i'm telling you again and again of the result result is you know going to happen in respect to whatever it is but the only thing that we can do is do the best in the current time so just keep doing what you want to do and uh, just keep hoping miracles do occur when you manifest good for yourself only good will happen if you doubt yourself there will be doubts so only manifest good thing for yourself tell that i can do it automatically things will happen and uh, it's it's going to happen i'm sure that you all will do well in your exams and i'm waiting to hear from all of you in the other end okay 
Take care everyone and bye-bye. Good night.